it's in the interest of those in the GNU to stay. Because this is an arranged marriage, right? They're not together because they're madly in love. Mm. It's a marriage of convenience and they all need to work to make it work. Proximity to power mm. that I think is seductive. Initially, when I heard of Unfollowed, when I was first approached to do Unfollowed, I went, no, thank you. Sorry, but the politicians are our employees. Hmm. Are they not? Na, 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 na. Spread the fire. Welcome back to SMWX. And today I'm really excited to be joined by someone who needs no introduction, who works in various spheres of South African media and has distinguished himself as a broadcaster and interviewer and someone who just understands how to get the juice out of those people who he is speaking to. It's quite strange to be interviewing Tembegile Mkhototo. It's quite strange to be interviewed. Yeah. How um, does it, it's, how does it's it feel? It's an awkward thing because yeah. I'm used to being on that side of the conversation, right? Which yeah. is what I've done for, what, a decade? Mm. So whenever I have to sit on this side, it, it feels like I have to relinquish power. I'll unpack mm. my relationship with control in mm. therapy. <laughs> but yeah, this is a, it's an interesting experiment. But I think I owe you one. Because how many times have I been putting this off? Uh, you've blue ticked me about six times, I think. You so. bl blue ticked me about four times? <laughs> <laughs> We've blue ticked each other at various points. But it's good to be here. It's great to have you. And, you know, part of what we do on this channel is, you know, ask people who work in the media what it's like. Because... You are in the public eye so much, but you actually never get to tell your story. You're always telling someone else's story. And I find it fascinating to hear the story of those who tell others' stories. Um, tell us your story. I mean, how did you how did you become interested in broadcasting in the media? Was it something you always wanted to to do? Always. Um, I always knew that I would end up working as a newsreader. Because, I mean, growing up as a child of the 90s, You'd, we didn't really have 24-hour news channels locally mm. um, until ENCA became the first one and then came the others. But I knew from a very young age that that's what I wanted to do. There was just mm. something about news anchors at the time that appealed to me. I remember being about, what, six years old? Mm. And I had one of those little chairs I remember it was red. Mm. And I'd sit in front of the TV um, watching the newsreaders at the time from Nokolo Khrutbom because my dad watched Wow. All the bulletins. Spoke no English, but we still watched the English really? bulletin. So it would start at seven o'clock. Mm. We'd watch the news at seven. It would be either Sally Bedet, if you're watching mm. ATV, mm. on SABC3, Joanne Joseph, Mandragas in Patra. Those were the news readers. 7.30, we'd move on to the Nguni bulletin on the SABC. Wow. Okay. With Nokolo Khrutbum, Am Nokolo Khrutbum, the late Bongile Sokulu, Kola Nigwala. The late Kola Nigwala was on that uh, slot as well. And from then on, I just had a fascination with news and current affairs and hmm. it's what I always wanted to do. I have no memory of wanting to do anything different. And then hmm. added to that, and then I discovered people like Lerato Mbele, who was also on the news yeah. at the time, Reedy, Rights and Recourse. Oh, yes. That became my show. When I got into current affairs, that's when I fell in love, I think, with the interviewing because hmm. you had Rudy Kabi doing Rights and Recourse. Nigiwe Pikicha, I think, was on Interface. And those were my influences. And ultimately, hmm. even when you got to high school, grade 10, end of grade nine, actually, when we all choose our subjects. And this was in the late 2000s when everyone was being sort of directed towards taking up science, mathematics, because that's how you were told you were going to find work, right? Mm -hmm. But I knew that I didn't want to be a doctor. I didn't want to be a lawyer. I wanted to be a broadcaster. Hmm. And that's when I, I, I picked subjects that were aligned with that. Economics, um, I had history as well, I think. Um, and those were my core subjects languages as well was quite strong in those mm. because ultimately this was the goal and even when i finished in matric i knew that i was going to study journalism when i went to university and that's what i did at the university of the free state in first year was 2011. tell us a bit more about your upbringing and where you come from bloemfontein can you believe it <laughs> i'm from Bl i know <laughs> random right <laughs> love it uh mm. born and raised in bloemfontein um mm. Fairly normal township life, I would say. The youngest of three siblings from my mom's side. These are black, black math. Stick with me. <laughs> three siblings from my mom's side. And I've got three other older siblings from my dad's side. So when my parents met. Mm. Um, they then got married and had me after they were both divorced from their previous partners. Mm. Uh, grew up in Bloemfontein. 
went to school in Bloom, started varsity in Bloom. Um, in fact, started broadcasting in Bloemfontein on community radio. Hmm. My first experience of radio was on a community radio station called Motel FM in Bloemfontein. I was 19 and oh. in first year. Hmm. And I still remember it was February of that year, the first time I ever sat behind a microphone and presented a news bulletin. It we was need a- to find these archives. <laughs> <laughs> it was a Saturday afternoon. I mean, look, they played something on the radio recently. My team on 947 played yeah. um, a recording from 10 years ago, my wow. first bulletin on 702 mm. in mm. 2014. Wow. I, I, I'm glad my voice has sort of broken since then. Well, that makes one of us. <laughs> <laughs> and I sounded like a child, but you know, mm. I, I wanted this. It's what I wanted to do. Yeah. And I, I'm glad that I've been able now to do it for at least commercially for a decade. You know, when I look at what you have been able to do in media, I'm struck by two things, which I want to get into. The one, which I'll park, is how you're able to straddle serious news and current affairs and then popular culture and music and and those two worlds, which are distinct in themselves. But what I remember, I don't even know if you'll remember, but I think the first time I met you, I was standing in for Eusebius on 702. Ah, yes. And you were, I think you were a newsreader at the time. Mm -hmm. um, And yo, you were a hard worker already back then. Like, you work hard. Like, (laughs) you you, you work in the morning, you work in the afternoon, you work in the evening. At all times. I don't like, you probably have a midnight show somewhere that you also do. (laughs) Like, not right. yet, but if anyone's hiring, <laughs> yeah. I am free between midnight and 4 a.m. <laughs> but the rate, the rate <laughs> might well, be... let's y- tap into that two-part. Yesterday's price <laughs> is not today's price. But, like, you've really, you've really worked hard to, to get where you are. Where does that work ethic come from? And, and t- take us through, like, what, what one of your... At the, at the height of doing so many different shows, what one mm. of those days would have looked like? So... I'll start with the work ethic. Mm. The work ethic comes from, so it's a layered thing, I suppose. It comes from my parents, firstly. My parents, hard workers. My Mm. mom recently retired Mm. at 59. Both have always been hard workers. For an example, uh, my father was not an educated man. He never set foot in a classroom, but he left his village in the Eastern Cape, Mm. ended up working in the mines in the Free State. When mining Mm. dried up in the Free State, he got a job as a cleaner at the local zoo. Hmm. in Bloemfontein with no formal education, not even a grade one, right? But worked hard. Yeah. And in working hard, all he wanted to do was to make sure that I got the very best in terms of education. Hmm. My mom, very similar, comes from a family where she had eight siblings, only went to school up to what standard eight, which would be grade 10 today, hmm. was a domestic worker with her domestic worker earnings, managed to get her little brother through varsity, and that's how he became the first graduate hmm. I- in her family, on my maternal side of the family. Hmm. Um, at some point, my mother was, after my dad passed in 2005, hmm. my mom was working seven days a week wow. to raise three boys, hmm. basically. Hmm. So that's where I think the work ethic comes from. Hmm. But in that story, because we didn't have a lot, I think when you grow up, I suppose poor, I didn't feel poor then, mm. you realize very quickly that you have to sink or swim. And part of what has always driven me is the fact that I don't want to go back there because I know mm. how tough it is. Mm. So to to live the sort of life that I live now, but also to be able to provide for my mother, who's now retired, mm. I always knew that I had to work hard. But I also loved it. And I still mm. do. I love broadcasting. If And I've always, my friends always laugh. I always say to them, I could work at any time. Because, you know, in the industry, people are very fussy about Mm. time slots. Am I on in the morning? Am I on in the evening? Mm. It's a big deal. But if you put me on air at 2 a.m., I will still show up the same way I would show up at 6 p.m. Because that's how much I enjoy it. I mean, you've done live broadcasting. There's a... Mm. Mm. There's an adrenaline. There's nothing I, like it, I've right? Ne- I've never felt anything like it. Really? Oh yeah. And you, yeah. I, I, I love the feeling of riding the wave, mm. and especially with mm. with live television. What I found was not knowing what was going to come Absolutely. next, and people don't know that you don't know, and you yes. have to just be like, I, I'm fine. If, whatever comes, I'm in control. I'm in command. Right? Because sometimes you go on air, season, and um, it's a normal story. You're thinking, okay, we're covering a protest mm. in Bolugwane. Uh, floods in another part of the country. The president is answering questions in parliament. Five minutes into that show, a statement drops. Mm. And it's a huge news development. 
And that's what you need to do. I remember my mm. first day at Newsroom Africa, actually. Mm. It was a Saturday afternoon. It was right at the beginning of the July riots wow. in 2021. And I remember being on air when they found the first body mm. in JP's town. Mm. No idea where it would go. By the end of that shift, there were trucks burnt on the M3 mm. to case it in. Mm. And the story was taking shape. And the rest, as we know about that week, was that many of us were on air for countless hours. No script. You just have to go interview Caesar, who may be a police spokesperson, interview a minister if a minister is available, cross to a community member, speak over pictures, try to make mm. sense of what's going, what's going on. And I mean, those are tra that's a tragic example of something that happened in the country. But when you, when you love the business of broadcasting, especially mm. news, mm. those are the moments that test you and you get to yeah. test yourself. And, uh, enjoy is perhaps not the word in the tragic circumstances, but there's something about being able to to wrap your head around that in real time, mm, mm. deliver the information in a sensible way, and come out of it mm. without having messed up that makes you go, wow, wow. I want to hop on again tomorrow. That's so true. You know, I, there's this massive fear of pub public speaking, mm -hmm. and people are... are afraid of speaking to even small groups of people you must try live tv people like like and it's just the yeah. camera eh? yeah yeah just the camera so you can't see the people but you know that you're going out to all these people and and like to compose yourself for that mm -hmm. we probably don't speak about like what what you go through behind the scenes enough um and how much skill it takes how much skill it takes because people are watching and they just want to get the news and, and you're conveying it to them but they're not thinking about you know how you've prepared over the long term and the short term for mm. that. I remember sitting in the control room of SABC before my show, and it was Bongiwe and Iman, two consummate professionals. They're both amazing. I, I think I worked with both yeah. at some point at they E are. and at Newsroom. Now, I realized there were levels to the game that night because something had happened, and, and, they, and in the control room, they were just like, ad lib, ad lib. Mm -hmm. And they just ad-libbed for like 20 minutes, but made it look like it was completely normal. Mm. And, and ad-lib yeah. for people who don't know means talk or <clears throat> say something off the top of your head exactly. and pray it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And between them, they were riffing off each other. And I was like, you're telling me that I was not prepared. Mm -hmm. And the audience was none the wiser. I think, and that's, for example, was it last year or the year before when there was the gas explosion in the CBD mm. where no mm. one knew what was going on and mm. we were all waiting mm. to get mm. reporters there. Mm. But you have to keep talking. Yeah. Until the reporter gets there, because everyone who's tuning in, by the way, yeah. the audience um, is not, say, they don't give you a moment to go, well, I don't know either. Heck, I'm trying <laughs> to figure it out. Exactly. You They're tell like, hey, me. Bo, you're on the news, you're wearing a tie and a jacket. So mm. you must know what's going on. Mm. Hello. Yeah. We need what's to know. going on in the CBD? And yeah. in those moments, you also have such a great responsibility. And I think we don't talk enough about this mm. to keep a cool head. Because if mm. if you mm. are unraveling on air, yeah. Yeah. in especially in moments of crisis in the country, if you unravel on air, you transfer that panic mm. onto the viewer, right? So mm. especially mm. when mm. we're still trying to figure out what exactly is going on, you also have to then keep saying to people, this is what we know. Mm. We don't know why it's happened, but we're waiting for someone in authority yeah. to explain and put it in context. But at this point, let's all just take a step mm. back and look mm. at it. And you come in, you talked about preparation. Mm. Generally, my preparation would start from, because I'm on radio in the morning, yeah. uh, for a news shift, preparation would start from the morning when I see what's going on either in the papers mm. or in terms of what I'm reading um, on radio that morning. So then I would send through suggestions to the team that's working on a particular show saying, maybe let's get... Uh, this minister, this mm. official, this community leader to come on and talk about A, B, C, and D. So it starts from the morning. Mm. It also includes a lot of listening to the news throughout the day, watching what's going on, on across the channels. Mm. Mm. Going in, I'm usually, if I'm on air at six, for example, mm. I will probably be at the office by half past three, hmm. just to get a sense of things and mm. prep, because then you get your list of guests, then I'll do my reading, go online, see what's out there, read statements, old articles if necessary, mm. so that by the time we get to 6 p.m., I've got at least, because my, my prep entails coming up with five questions for each interview. 
Right, right. And that's about a 10 minute interview. So I need five questions. Mm. Now I may only ask two, mm. but I like having the five there as it's a comfort thing, I suppose. Mm. It's my safety blanket. Mm. Mm. Straddling current affairs and and the world of popular culture, what's that like? Because very few can do both at the same time. And what are the what are the differences and what are the similarities? Um uh straddling both has been interesting yeah. because like you said, not everyone can do it. Not if, I think I'm possibly the only one yeah, I would who, say. who's doing it in that way where mm. Mm. I'm on a, I've been on mainstream TV news anchoring and then I'm on 947 where we're having fun. We're talking about relationships, music, mm. etc. cetera. It, it's been interesting in the sense that the, the different audiences have different reactions, right? Yeah. So someone will say in a supermarket, if they're super casual, I know these are my these are my radio people. Mm, mm, so mm, mm, there's a familiarity, we're more of a yeah, friend thing. Yeah. If it's an older man in his fifties mm. who wants to ask a state capture or pala pala <laughs> question, I'm like, you're from TV. Yeah, yeah. But I've been lucky in that they haven't clashed because mm. you would expect that mm. the two would clash, but they haven't. And I think that's, clear in the work that I've done. I mean, last mm. year, um, I worked on Unfollowed, which was oh, yes. mainly centered around public figures, but celebrities, right, in yeah. the main. Yeah. And then fast forward a year later, I was working on The Big Debate, mm. which was heavy current affairs, election season, etc. Yeah. So I've been lucky in that it all just seems to have balanced. And I think it plays to um, different parts of my, char- my personality. Because mm. I am generally off air, quite playful mm. and that's why i'm able to function within the music radio space even when it came about i had gone into stand in on nine for seven mm. uh one afternoon i think for a week actually and i said something they asked me a question and i said something and then i was like oh he's kind of funny <laughs> and a year later i was on the show full time wow and it happened by chance because that was never the dream i thought i was going to get to Joburg, do my serious journalism mm. and then if i grow up to be a really good boy I'll end up with a talk radio show. Mm, mm. Never in my wildest dreams did I think that I'd spend seven of my 10 years at Prime Media on a music station. That wasn't the mm, goal, but mm. now I love it. It's my, I always say it's my, it's the easy part of my day. Mm. Yeah, it's amazing to be able to, to do both. You, you mentioned Unfollowed. Wow. What a... <sighs> Unfollowed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was watching back some of those episodes and what what was most interesting to me mm-hmm. is your role in getting people to divulge and and ask those difficult questions and getting people to actually respond and talk us through how you did that because it's not an easy thing to to actually go there with with people who who don't want to talk about certain things but mm-hmm. you you got them to open up in a way that was um unprecedented in, in many ways for, for their public record? I think um, Unfollowed was interesting for me um, mm. in different ways because initially when I heard of Unfollowed, when I was first approached to yeah. do Unfollowed, I went, no, thank you. Because in my mind, I thought tabloid journalism. Mm. I don't mm. want to be mm. part of anything that would be sensationalized. And I worried a lot about what I was saying to you earlier about um, the intersection between the career I've built as a hard news yeah. presenter, journalist person versus now going into something where people might go, mm. is he still a serious journalist? Mm. But when I, when I eventually got in, one of the, the first things I always insist on when I do any sort of project is that, yeah, you can give me the research because you, there's a producer who will research and give you mm. an information pack, an info pack in broadcasting mm. that you go through to prepare. But I've, I always insist on, doing my own prep, mm. i.e. the questions. Mm. I must always, don't feed me the questions, basically. Right. Yeah. So yeah. going into Unfollowed, um, I try to prep as much as I can because mm. some of the stories I was familiar with, some of the stories I wasn't familiar with. Yeah. And I had to have, a, I think, a talk with myself the night before we started filming to say, I'm going to do it the way I know how to do interviews, right? Because mm. there are so many ways in which you could approach these things. But mm. I wanted to do it my way. And I wanted to... 
get as much information as possible. And mm -hmm. hopefully, because these were people, remember the premise was on cancel culture, people yeah. who've done things, either been in court or either committed other transgressions, things mm -hmm. that society finds unforgivable, unfor right? Mm -hmm. So their stories may have been told publicly, but what I wanted in the eight episodes was to hopefully ask a question or questions that mm -hmm. would leave people with something new mm -hmm. about these mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. without it being tacky. Yeah, I was hoping it wouldn't be tacky. Opinions, I think, are split on, on how well we did. But that was the goal. I, I wanted to go in and do a show that ultimately, at the end of it, had some level of integrity mm. and did the stories, if not all, most justice. Mm. Mm. Sam, I just wanted to interrupt this episode to let you know the four ways you can help SMWX. Way number one, you can invite me to speak at your institution or company. Way number two, you can advertise on this channel. Way number three, you can become a member of this channel. The link to the membership is down below. And number four, you can buy merch that's books or hoodies. Now let's get back to the episode. All our contact details are in the description box below. So Unfollowed, what was the hardest moment of that show for you? What? I don't think there was a specific moment from Unfollowed that I would say was the hardest. I think it was challenging. Mm. Um, what was most challenging about Unfollowed, and again, in the context of the work that I do, right? I do happy radio. Yeah. And then I do traditional news where on any given night I'd be interviewing a politician um, or any other newsmaker. But on Unfollowed, I found myself in a situation where for four days straight, because we filmed eight episodes in four days. Oh, okay. You did I was back to back. Yeah, I was almost always sitting across someone who was having an emo either an emotional outburst mm. or some other kind of emotional reaction, be it um, when Tolasmo gets up and he's frustrated. And by mm. the way, to clarify, he wasn't swearing at me. Yeah. Um, he was frustrated because he could hear people the crew in the background, I think, and they were talking about something related to our microphones, whether they could hear us or not. Mm. So in that moment of frustration, he then jumps up um, and I won't repeat what he said. Yeah. And then you've got that. And then in some of the other interviews, there were lots of tears as well. Mm. Mm. Um, a lot of anger as well, because a lot of the people who were un unfollowed felt like they hadn't been given a fair chance or they'd mm. been mistreated in some way. So coming from an environment where Anger is not always the emotion. It's not the, the general emotion that I would be dealing with. Sure. I had to go, oh, mm. this is different. Also because I suppose I'm not the sort of person who generally knows what to do with mm. a crying person or someone who's having a big emotional moment. So mm. I, I had to, in those moments, think very quickly, do we stop the interview? Do we continue? I, I preferred that we continue so that whoever's watching would see what was happening and then make up their own mind whether mm. they felt sympathetic or not. Because mm. I don't think ultimately my role on the show was to make a decision or make a call for the viewer. They had to do that themselves. I mean, <laughs> and they have. Because yeah. you get, when you look at the feedback, it goes from, oh, that was a great interview to, yeah. you're the worst interviewer in the country. Welcome but, to the club. But yeah. you take it as it comes, right? Because yeah. you go, if I'm the worst, wasn't Caesar the worst last week? Is this <laughs> yeah. like is this thing rotating? Yeah, monthly? exactly. I thought you guys said it was Clement. <laughs> no, why am I in it? Yeah. yeah, you know we don't talk enough about that and and the social media climate that flows from interviewing a well-known mm. politician or celebrity, and how, how do you deal with that? You know, how do you deal with the the, the public backlash? You know. And people assume that because you've interviewed this person, you either love them or you hate them or you hate their enemies or you love their friends. Like you have some sort of di deep position mm. on who and what they are, mm. right? And you've planned this out and, and you are only speaking to this person because you want to, I, I, like, the consp how do you deal with the conspiracy and you're going, theory? I don't know this man. <laughs> like, My dear, I'm on shift and huh? I'm doing a job. Yeah. Um, it, it's interesting because you asked me what was the hardest part of Unfollowed. I think that may have been it because mm, mm, for mm, eight mm. weeks 
Wow. Every Thursday. It was just trending and trending. I would just have to sit through yeah. feedback. And I've that's that for me is the weirdest thing about doing mm. interviews. I think the most uncomfortable part of doing interviews for me mm. is when the feedback mm. starts coming in. Because then, oh especially on a platform like X, because there's a lot. And you then have to sit there and go, do I go through mm. the feedback or do I ignore all of it? Mm, mm, uh, mm. But then maybe there might be something actually with merit that mm. I might miss mm. if I decide not to look. So what I do is I look, but you probably won't get a response. And then mm. the really crazy ones are just mute. Mm. I'm just like, okay, mm. that's not what happened. You took 36 seconds mm. of an hour long show. And now you're baiting your followers to yeah. basically yeah. come up with a narrative. So what I do with social media is I don't take on too much of the praise because if you don't dwell in the praise, I find the, the, critis the criticism also is not as big a deal because ultimately how I see it is I come in, I do the interview. Mm. I am hypercritical of my work anyway. So if I've done a crap interview, I know, right? Mm. So mm. I will know where there were issues with the interview anyway. Mm. And I'm not, I don't outsource the crit to someone on social media who actually, by the way, is, is themselves fueled by an allegiance, a dislike. Because mm. often the people who will be saying to you, yeah, Cesar, you did a bad interview um, with Floyd, mm. or you did a great interview with Floyd because mm. you either love him or hate him, whatever, mm. themselves mm. have a position yeah. on the person, their party, their history. Yeah. And that colors their framing as well of the feedback. And I think if you have that at the back of your mind as well, it makes it easy to go, mm. it is what it is. Mm. You charge it to the game. That's that's for sure. And and TV TV news in particular is and 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 the nightly news broadcast mm. is is a particular venue. It's it's a lot of pressure. Talk us through your experience. I mean you were on ENCA, but Newsroom is where you were like hosting a very important mm -hmm. show and platform. What did you learn during that period? And, and how do you look back on, on your Newsroom time? Newsroom Africa? Yeah. I think Newsroom, um, Newsroom Africa was fun. Mm. It was, when I got to Newsroom, this is 2021, mm. they were only two years old, right? So they were still wow. trying to establish themselves in a way. And I got to be front and center of a lot of the big moments on the channel. Mm, so, mm. and they were young and the benefit of working for a younger channel is that people are more open to experimenting, more open to different talent. So that was nice in a way. I really enjoyed being able to move across the different shows because I moved quite a bit of news and I was only there for Three years. Mm. But in that three years, I started from weekends and I was doing lunchtime. Then ultimately, by the time I left in January this year, I was doing the evening news. Mm. And it was it was nice to be part of the building effort. I'd never launch a channel because yeah. from friends who've been part of the launch of a channel, that's a whole other, other experience. But mm. I think it was nice for me to be part of the establishment, shall we say, of a new channel and you yeah. look at them now they're growing i mean they're flourishing mm. um they've got a new editor-in-chief now who is super experienced i mean everyone who knows Mappy will tell you she was part of enca's heyday so mm. you can mm. only imagine what she's going to do with newsroom in their fifth year it was nice while it lasted but there came a time where it was yeah it was time to go are you able to give us any insight into why because Yo, that announcement of yours rocked, rocked <laughs> social media. And um, I mean, you, you are clearly like at the peak of your, of your game. Mm -hmm. I know for a fact that your slot was doing very well as well. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> I, to have seen I don't know where it was by the time I left, mm. but I'll say this. It was interesting because leading up to when I resigned, I think I resigned in December. Mm. And when was my last day? Sorry, I'm chewing gum. Is this allowed on a podcast? By all means, all <laughs> things are allowed. <laughs> but just, just don't shout at the crew in the background. But then... <laughs> <laughs> what? That guy over there really looked nervous. Um, so by the time I left Newsroom Africa, there were things I wanted to do that were not going to be allowed. For example, 
doing other projects outside oh, okay. of a specific channel. And I see. to what we were talking about earlier, mm. I like being able to tap in yeah. to different projects. Mm. And when it became clear that that was not going to work, mm. then I could no longer stay. Mm. Because ultimately, you choose to stay and then are you going to keep complaining about the same thing? Mm. Or are you going to go, okay, this is... These are the the company's conditions. These are my desires. They're mm. no longer aligned. Mm. So let me be on my way. Hmm. And that was the decision I made. Hmm. And yeah, ultimately that's what happened. I was saying, actually not too long ago to someone that had I stayed, for example, I would not have been able to present a show like Big Debate. Sure. Like I did this year, because Big Debate was yeah. on a different channel, yeah. produced by external people. And as a journalist in South Africa or a news broadcaster, there are very few things that you can put on your CV that are bigger than presenting the big debate. Sure. But no, I mean, I still watch Newsroom Africa. Mm. No hard mm. feelings. I've got friends who work there. Yeah. And I, I still tune in from time to time and they're doing great work. I mean, my, my thinking on South African news channels is we need as many of them as possible. Mm. Mm. Simply, if for no other reason, but to create employment. Because if you look at yeah. how many of us exist in this space. That's true. We can't all work for the same three channels, right? Mm. You have to move on at some point. And I think they all offer different things. Mm. And that was that was it, really. There wasn't a deeper reason other than yeah. our demands and expectations of each other had changed. Mm. Mm. Isn't that what happens when, couple break, when couples break up? <laughs> it is. <laughs> It is. Yeah. It is. No, that's that's interesting. I'm I'm sure um we won't have seen the last of you on broadcast TV like news broadcast prime time. Um I don't know about prime time, mm. but I'm starting to miss it. Mm. I'm starting to miss daily news. Interesting. Like I was saying, there's a an adrenaline that mm. comes with being on daily news mm. that I, I think I'm starting to miss. Um I hope to go back. Mm. I hope to go back, perhaps differently. I think I've always been followed by almost the same thing. I always end up somewhere doing an evening slot. At ENCA, I got to do that as well. So I'm either on at lunchtime or in the evening. So I'm hoping to do something different. For example, mm. at the moment, I'd love to do something, something with a more global focus, mm. maybe. Mm. Mm. Something mm. different. Do you know what I mean? So much is going mm. on around us. You look at what's going on. In Sudan, yeah. it doesn't get enough coverage here. Neighboring Mozambique, they've had an mm. election. There are issues coming out of that. And when you watch South African TV, yeah, there are the interviews, mm. there is the analysis, but we're not really doing a deep dive. And I'm yeah. not sure if there's appetite for that on traditional television, mm. but I would definitely want to do something with a strong continental feel or something more global for a domestic audience mm. still. Mm. What are some of the the behind the scenes stories or or difficult moments that we may not have have fully understood on on your news interviewing side? Because you've spoken about unfollowed. Like, uh -huh. what's it like to have to interview powerful politicians, and and what are some of the pressures that you feel? And are there any stories that come to mind um, of of the the trials and tribulations of of that that role? Um, how so? What it is is, I suppose. Because these are people in authority, sometimes there is a, not a fear, but people are hesitant to upset them, right? Because so um, especially producers, producers will tell you that if you upset Minister X, mm. we might not get them back on the show. Because mm. that does happen where oh. a politician will say, I'm oh, yeah. never talking to Cesar again. Oh, so let's... you're going in there. Yes, you want to do a tough interview and you may ultimately do. Yeah. But you're also aware that your producer is counting on you not ruining this for them because they've got a black book and they need to be able to call on these people at some point. So mm, mm. there's a lot of that. There isn't, in South Africa, people want, talk about people, journalists being instructed not to ask or to ask. That's never happened to me. Mm. And I think it's because I've also had editors who know that I'm not, that's not really how you'd step up to me with yeah. a whole, you will not ask <laughs> this question. And sometimes you go on air and you've prepared and the person completely goes berserk and you go, mm. this is not what I, I, I bargained on. Mm. But you, you continue, you do the interview and it goes as well as can be. I think I've only ever had 
one politician, hmm. who no two actually, who completely went off at me. One said that she actually refused to do interviews with me for a while. Hmm. After that interview, but you move on. We're fine now. Okay. So that's been dealt with, mm. but that's never going to stop me from asking you the questions. I think yeah. you sort of have to be brave and push your way through, which is what I've always done. And my policy is if, if the newsmaker feels that this interview is reason for them to never speak to me again, and I feel the question or questions asked were fair, then I have no regrets. Mm. Mm. then it is what it is. They have to take it as it is. Yeah, yeah. You know, this thing of people feeling like they have to bow down to politicians, I think is actually quite deep-seated. Maybe not explicitly. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm also not going to name names, but you've got me onto something that I've been grappling with recently, right? The, so the, <laughs> there, 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 there's a power, there are powerful people and I keep getting told, no, you must, you must call this person and just, you know, just, just, and I'm like, be nice. Yeah. Yeah. Just call them and clarify and whatever. Um, it's not Julius Malema, by the way, because I, now I just realized. Are you sure? <laughs> now, now I just Because you realized. did do an interview three days ago. <laughs> yeah, people so who there. was it? Now I'm way. like, now people are going <laughs> to jump to conclusions. It's not, it's not Julius. Um, but I was actually talking to my producer and, and he was like, wait, why? Yes. Like why what, do I have to apologize? What, yeah, I didn't do anything wrong. I asked a question. Why do I now have to behind the scenes? And it's funny because it's journalists telling me this, right? And like, yeah, just call and then, but really, why, why do we have to do that? Like, There's also a lot of excusing of bad behavior, right? Because people say, oh no, so-and-so just has a temper, you know? Yeah, yeah, you have to understand him. Mm -hmm. No, um, mm -hmm. sorry, but the politicians are our employees. Hmm. Are they not? It's true. That's true. We elect them, mm. we elect their parties, mm. Mm. and they serve ultimately because we've put our vote behind them. Mm. And as the media, you then have a responsibility to get answers for that same audience that yeah. voted for these people. Even if you didn't vote for them, you're affected by whatever decisions they make. Mm. So the fact that they don't like a question doesn't mean it's a bad question, mm. doesn't mean it shouldn't be asked. In fact, sometimes it means you've asked the right question. Yeah. And there's also a thing about Proximity to power mm. that I think is seductive. So and true. some in the media like that. So People true. like being able to, oh, if I call mm. up Minister X, mm. she'll take my call or he'll take my call. Because, you know, we've got a good relationship. Mm. But does, does that mean we don't? Ask them difficult questions. Yeah. And by the way, I'm not saying people who enjoy those relationships give the politicians a free ride. But sure. there's a lot of that because everyone wants access. Mm. Mm. And th there's a feeling sometimes that if you push too hard, you'll be denied access. Yeah. That's fine. Then I'll, you can deal with the opposition sitting in the chair constantly, mm. or you could come on and have your say, because mm. ultimately it's not about me. Mm. Presenters come and go, but the public remains. Yeah. And I think maybe one thing the public doesn't know is that relationships between people in the media and politicians, while in public it looks like they're on different sides mm -hmm. of the divide, the, they actually, in many ways, know each other very well. And mm. it's not as obviously divided as, as you think it is. Like, there, there are serious relationships between media and politics in this country. And some are friends, right? I'm, oh, I'm uncomfortable, time. I think, mm. with the concept of being friends with a politician, especially if you cover mm. said politician, mm. because what does that mean for the way in which you cover them? But people have relationships with politicians. I think of myself, um, my generation of reporters, news anchors, would have been on Twitter a good 12 years ago, 13 years ago, when, for example, Fees Must Fall activists mm, mm. were also students. So we were about the same age. We sure. may have hung out in the same places. So these are people who you knew before some of them became members of a portfolio committee, mm. a deputy mm. minister, mm. a minister perhaps in some instances. So mm. you're constantly now especially in re in the latter years, having to watch the way in which you navigate that relationship where Caesar, who I knew on Twitter mm. back when we used to tweet about date my family mm. in 2016, <laughs> is now a, a deputy minister or mm. a minister. So now the relationship is different. At least the public facing relationship mm. is different. And if you are friends, unfortunately, what you then have to do is say, 
I can't interview my friend. Or if you interview your friend, you and your friend are just going to have to understand that we're going to have an awkward exchange, mm -hmm. but we're both doing our jobs. Now, I know you're not necessarily an analyst, so I don't know to what extent you, you feel comfortable speaking about the, the politics of the day. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, often people who are in your position never get to actually say what, <laughs> you know, what you actually think mm -hmm. about what's happening. And you're not necessarily broadcasting so much news stuff right now. So mm -hmm. maybe we're catching you at a good time. And then they'll catch me when I come yeah, back. Yeah, exactly. Then no one will ever be, want to be interviewed by you. No, yeah. I'm pretty sure you won't have a problem with that. Um, but like, what do you make of uh, where we are right now? We've got this unprecedented coalition, mm. um, the ANC and the DA working together for the first time, an election where, you know, the ANC suffered massive defeats. It's still in power. Um, as someone who's been watching South African news for mm. as long as you say you have, how do you interpret this moment that we're in? It's a year of firsts, right? 2024 mm. is a year of firsts. An ANC that's below 50%. Yeah. An ANC that's working with a DA like, and the FF Plus. Like, wow. In this government of national unity. Yeah. And everyone, I think all of us have had to do adjusting mm. in how we, we deal with it, right? Because firstly, I, I think we've spent too much time at the moment on the personality politics, mm. which is what we tend to do a lot mm. in South Africa. Very so true. what's sexy is, Very true. oh, President Ramaphosa said this, mm. um, Helen Zilla got upset, yeah. and then she tweeted, mm. and then we go back and forth, right? For a week, we're all interviewing um, either Nomvula Mukonyani from the, D from the ANC to say, how do you respond to what Zilla said? Mm. And she responds, and then you get Zilla on air, and then mm. you say to her, well, this is what Mukonyani said, how do you respond? Mm. But we've spent very little time, I think, in my honest opinion, in just even explaining some of the terms that govern this GNU. Mm. As we, I mean, there was some reporting when it was first established, right? Yeah. But if you think about it, every few weeks, someone says, oh, the DA is going to pull out of the GNU. DA then does not pull out of the GNU. Mm. Um, then they all meet and then it's all resolved. Mm. And you wonder, are we going to go through a good four and a half years of constantly saying, ooh, these ones are going to leave the GNU. Mm. Mm. And, and no one, when, when do we do the deep dive into why actually yeah. it's in the interest of those in the GNU to stay? Because this is an arranged marriage, right? They're not together because they're madly in love. Mm. It's a marriage of a convenience and they all need to work to make it work. Mm. Because if it doesn't work, I mean, the DA was very clear that if this, if they did not join the GNU, their biggest fear was that the ANC was going to go and get the numbers very quickly, work with the EFF, work with mm. the MKP, mm. Mm. and that would be it. So yeah. often in the personality politics, we lose track of the substantive issues. So, so even with the Bella Bill, oh, the DA is opposed to the Bella Bill. Which part mm. uh, of the Bella Bill? What, what are they upset about in the act itself? Mm. And what does it say? How would it affect the viewer? Because mm. often we don't explain why, how, how the contentious issue would affect the person watching. Last True. week, everyone was reporting on President Ramaphosa at the BRICS summit. Mm. Mm. Uh, oh, he said South Africa, has a, Russia has an ally. How about a deep dive into the history of the Soviet Union, mm. Russia, why the ANC in particular has such a, a close relationship? And yeah. the other part of it has to do with the old topic of juniorization in newsrooms where people mm. haven't been around long enough. But we're also in a fast food era of news where we want to cover the now. And yeah. it's not even up to the reporters. Editors want you on air to report on the statement. Mm. Um, the statement came out five minutes ago. Mm. So you have to go on air and talk about the statement and make it make sense. And we're doing ourselves and the people watching a disservice because we're not contextualizing things mm. enough. Now, there are, by the way, there are moments, pockets where there is excellent work. I think print in particular still does a much better job at just pulling it all together. You've got people like T.D. Madia, for example, mm, who mm. does go online and do a what does it mean type of thing, which I find is very helpful. Yeah, it is. And we, we don't do enough actually in South Africa of the what does it mean? Yeah. Why yeah. does it matter? 
Absolutely. sort of journalism. So I think that is the thing we've often been guilty of where we report what Caesar is saying versus what Tim Begile is saying, and then we go back and forth with that, mm -hmm. and we never deal with why the viewer should care. It speaks to the social media thing as well, because I'm, I've also been fascinated by, for example, my interview with, with Floyd recently. Mm -hmm. If you actually watch that interview, it's not about Julius Malema. <clears throat> it's about various, various things, but like two minute clip gets cut and then it gets turned into this personal thing. Mm -hmm. So there's also a way in which the news gets personalized mm -hmm. and then newsrooms and broadcasters respond to that personalization by further personalizing mm -hmm. the narrative. And, and, and we do lose some of the depth of the analysis and what is actually happening when we do that. Right, because um, ultimately what people do is, and I've, I've seen it in the newsrooms where I've worked, where mm. ultimately people sometimes think, editors and journalists think that they have to give some, because this is what Twitter is saying, mm. this mm. is the angle. Yeah, and we must yeah. channel yeah. our output towards this. So you're pandering in a way mm. to what is easy. The easiest journalism is to report on personality. They don't like each other. Okay. Mm. But ultimately, where is the detailed reporting on what was actually announced by the MK in that briefing last week? Everyone mm. stuck to, mm. okay, they've got Busisu M. Kwebane now. They've got mm. Advocate M. Kwebane. They've got Willis M. Kunu. Mm. But that briefing went beyond that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I wish we would spend less time on the personality stuff and make sense of the more substantive issues. So mm. if you voted for Party X, this is what you're going to get. This is what they're actually saying. Mm. Okay, the GNU promised that they would do better at, I don't know, let's say the provision of housing. Let's go back in a year to areas where there was a housing backlog. Mm, mm. Has that gone down? It'll be a matter of, okay, this party has issued a statement saying the housing backlog is not being addressed. Let's get the housing minister on air. But mm. no one wants to go and go and see mm, how the people mm. affected by the housing backlog are actually living. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Same thing will happen. So you will interview someone for an hour and then the minute that's slightly mm. salacious mm. or that's a dig is what will spread. Yeah. Yeah, because it's what's easy, right? And everyone thinks they must report on that because that's what Twitter is talking about. Mm. But in, in an age where X and other social media has now become where news breaks, we still we now have to go back. What's become more important for us to contextualize events. Yeah, and I think that's what it, it is missing, which is what is great then about um, longer form programming, where you can actually break yeah. that down without the pressure of oh my goodness, it's an hour and we have to get 12 stories out. Mm, mm. I don't know if that makes sense. No, absolutely, absolutely. I wonder, we've spoken about the, the difficult moments. What are some of your more rewarding moments in, in broadcasting? I mean, you got to interview Trevor Noah, which is just unfair as well, which I- I mean, I was on the show that interviewed Trevor Noah. Oh, no, you were there, you were in the room. I was in the room, <laughs> breathing the same air, Trevor Noah. <laughs> just unfair. Um, I mean, that must've been cool, but yeah, whether that or other rewarding moments, are there, is there anything that stands out to you as when you were like, wow, that, that, that really felt like I was living and doing what I was supposed to be doing in that time? Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think, I can't think of a moment off the top of my head, but more generally, I think mm. what's helpful, for example, is when you're able to link someone who's watching or who's listening to someone who can solve their problem. Mm. I find that incredibly rewarding because then mm. we're going beyond a headline, right? So mm. lis a listener or a viewer says, okay, you were speaking to Minister X. This is my problem. Yeah. You link them and it gets resolved. In fact, last year during the delays, there was in fact a strike by these uh, foreign doctors, who South African doctors who'd studied abroad, mm. come back mm. home, there were issues with their paperwork. I think there are still issues. But ultimately, after an interview that I did with, I think, two of them and the HPCSA, I think it was, mm. there was movement. They finally got to write an exam. And I think when I got 
I got messages from a few of them who were saying, thank you for having this on the show. Mm. We're actually going to write an exam now. Mm. And they were saying, you know, this is life changing. Because remember, for a lot of them, the reason they were even studying in China is because they come from families where they did not have the means to study. Mm. And now they're back home. Their family situation hasn't changed, but it can only change if they get into work. They've studied, they're qualified doctors, but to provide for themselves and their families, they need to get into work. And that little thing, however mm. small anyone might be, mm. to be able to do an interview that sort of lights a fire under the bum of the people in charge, if you will, mm. and getting movement, that's rewarding. Fam, you asked for some SMWX merch and we have delivered. I know you're always looking for ways to help support and grow this channel. So why don't you buy yourself an SMWX hoodie? Super comfy, super warm, and you can represent SMWX. You can check the link down below for how to buy your SMWX hoodie and help build and grow this channel so we can bring you more interviews, more analysis, and more educational insights. Now let's get back to it. Your social media bio says uh, the story is still being written or, or it's just the beginning. Um, I hope, unless I drop dead. I think that's, <laughs> I think it's just the beginning, although it's been quite the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, where to from here? Where to from here? Um, I'm going to do a lot more shorter, more short-term projects, i.e. things like unfollow sure. things shows like big debate mm, mm. I, I enjoyed those i mean you go in with unfollowed i was i was there for a week mm. shot eight episodes and was out yeah. big debate was about 13 weeks so mm. slightly longer that was fun I, i'm at a point mm. where i want to spread my skills or learn in fact skills across different um sort of formats because mm -hmm. i think mm. that makes you a better broadcaster because i doing the everything i've done in the last year I think when I do go back to daily news, mm, mm. has I've learned something on those projects, which I think will con contribute to me being a better news anchor. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But also I just enjoy being in different environments, different um, subjects, etc. Because recently I worked on a project to do with artificial intelligence, mm. which was a, a space I'd never worked in. Mm. So that was mm. fascinating for me because although it's not the sort of work I would generally do, I got mm. to meet different people. I got to learn. Mm. Now, what I know about AI, for example, the use of artificial intelligence in medicine mm. may be very useful to conversations we're going to have about the NHI. You're just getting every bag that exists out there, aren't you? <laughs> Even the AI bag. Wow. Guys, I come from Bloemfontein, okay? <laughs> <laughs> you take the jobs while you can. But that's ultimately it. So I want to do a lot more of those shorter term things, but I do mm. want to go back, circle back, to daily news because I'm starting yeah. to miss it. So I want to do that. But like I said, I would love to do something with a more of a, an international feel, mm. ultimately, with a focus, yes, on Africa, but also the rest of the world. Because there's so much we don't fully explain or don't have the time to fully explain because ultimately you've got all these domestic issues that rightfully take priority. Well, Tembe Gilem Khototo. This is uh, part of our mission is is to give people their flowers while they can still smell them. So, thank you for the work that you're doing. And thank you. And shout out to to you for the work that you're doing. And most importantly, thank you for not blue ticking us this time. Well, thank you for having me. I, I won't be doing any other interviews after this. But <laughs> oh, thank wow. you for having me. It, it's a scary experience, it but is. I'm glad I did it. We're glad that you came, and uh, all the best for the future. Thank you, Caesar. Good luck to you. Thank you. Like, share, subscribe. Comment down below with your thoughts and help us get to that next milestone of 200,000 subscribers. Thanks for joining us. See you on the next one. Aye.